Hello and welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi and today we're talking about the bodily assumption of Mary. Did it happen? I've got a Protestant scholar on, Dr. Gavin Ortland. He's coming on the channel to uh, discuss this in a little bit of detail here and it's, it's going to be a, a pretty fun show today actually. And before we get started, Gavin, I wanted to actually just kind of update the audience and update you as well because I we, we could have talked about this before the show started but it just didn't come up. But I, I very close. I was very close to becoming Catholic very recently, and uh, I I kind of put the brakes on that just because I think that what I need to do in, intellectually is just to just do more work. Like I haven't even really given orthodoxy the time of day. I haven't even looked into these other types of objections that Protestants give from like the bodily assumption of Mary. So <clears throat> I, I just need to do more study on my own. I think that's a, a, a much safer way of doing it, even though I feel it's, I get this sort of sensation or like a feel or like a, you know, it's almost like a calling toward the Catholic church. That's what I've been experiencing lately. But um, I also realized that that can be kind of dangerous to like just go off of feelings and experiences and stuff. And so I'm trying to uh, to do my best to be careful here. So I just wanted to give the audience a, a little bit of an update here that I'm basically where I was and where I have been uh, as of late is where I just <clears throat> kind of confused about the whole situation, but I still consider myself Protestant, I would say. And so that's kind of where I am. Do you have any thoughts on that before we get into the, the bodily assumption? You yeah, know, that's great to hear. And just to comment on the wisdom of that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think I think uh, a godly person in any of the different traditions could appreciate that because uh, these issues are enormously complicated. I, there's no shortcuts. You know, there's no way around it where you just somehow get the silver bullet. I mean, that is my biggest source of concern in the uh, dialogues that happen is the triumphalism. You know, the spiking the football in the end zone with mm -hmm. triumph as though... I've found it. The other side is so dumb. <laughs> you know, it, just this simplistic approach. The issues are extremely complicated. So taking your time to really work through them uh, methodically, it sounds like a really wise approach. <clears throat> yeah. And I think I, I think it's everyone kind of deserves it too. like ju not just the audience, but my family, like they deserve to for me to slow down and, and take my time with it and really look into, uh, you know, as many of these issues as I can. So I think that's uh, and a part of that is, is coming from your advice, too. I mean, you and I have talked off air and stuff. And so that's it's I, I think it's really wise to to do that. And, and also, I mean, just more broadly, I think that philosophy is best done slowly. And so theology is probably the same way, like the, do your theology slowly as opposed to just like hearing one lecture or hearing something or, or finding some piece of evidence and you're like, okay, that's it. That's all I need for, you know, this entire theological view. It's like, no, it's probably better to, to slow down and really thoughtfully consider the, you know, the, the bigger picture. So <clears throat> anyways, so with that initial item out of the way, let's turn now to, uh, did you have something else that you wanted to add there? Just to quickly to say that it, it is a happy feeling too, when you do make a, a sort of more settled decision and you really feel settled and and a peace in your conscience. That's a great mm -hmm. feeling as opposed to what I have seen a lot of people do. They'll make a change and then a year or two down the road or five years down the road, even they'll have this kind of nagging feeling of like, oh, I'm, I went too fast. I didn't think mm -hmm. I didn't look down the road enough, but it's a wonderful thing to feel a settled conviction and peace in your conscience about where you end up. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, no, I think that's, that's great. So, let, all right, now let's turn to the bodily assumption of Mary. First of all, what got you interested in the subject before we actually talk about what that is? Because as a Protestant growing up, I had never heard of this. And I anticipate a lot of the audience members like, well, unless you're really steeped in these theological discussions, you, you may just never even have heard of this. And I didn't hear about it until I actually started to look into Catholicism itself. And so well, what got you interested in the bodily assumption of Mary? Yeah, it, it seems as though Mariology is an area where we're growing further apart, uh, Protestant and Catholic. Mm. So, you know, this is kind of a flashpoint in the uh, ecumenical engagement. Um, and I'm going to be mentioning the Catholic doctrine a lot. I, I do want to be clear up front that the Catholic view is extremely similar to uh, the view of uh, Mary's final end in a lot of the Eastern traditions, like Eastern Orthodoxy, for example. So, but it's sometimes it's easier just to to clarify the the issue at hand by focusing upon one tradition in terms of how it's articulated and understood. But yeah, I just you know this is an area. This is a tough area where I think you could say that in certain areas, Protestant and Catholic relations have made progress 
ecumenical dialogue has led to greater clarity and understanding and even uh, a moving towards one another to a degree. I try to be a realist about that and just state here's where we do agree, here's remaining areas of difference and not be too extreme in one way or the other. And you know, celebrate the good and then also acknowledge the, the differences. But this would be an area where I would say we are moving further apart. Uh, it seems as though the, the differences today are far greater than they were during the Protestant Reformation. Now, some of that is because Protestants have gone so far in the other direction. And I'm, I wanna be quick to acknowledge Protestant errors. There are many Protestant errors uh, at the street level. Many Protestants do have a kind of shallow, pragmatic practice. Uh, too low a view of the sacraments, many things like this where we can be enriched and strengthened by dialoguing with the non-Protestant traditions. But um, this would be an area where I would see the Roman Catholic Church as moving away from Catholicity. If you've got Catholicity, meaning the wholeness of, of the church. So if you think of like the Protestant Catholic divide as this terribly painful split within Christendom that happened 500 years ago, and you can acknowledge as a Protestant, I can acknowledge many Protestants have kind of continued, uh, you know, moving so f far that they've um, moved away from Catholicity. Now that's not true of all Protestants, but I think that's true of a lot. Well, I would say Mariology is an area where my concern is in the opposite direction. The Catholic Church is doing that. The Catholic Church is moving away from Catholicity because these are the more recent dogmas. 1854 is the third Marian dogma, the Immaculate Conception. 1950, not long ago, you know, a couple generations ago is uh, the timing for the bodily assumption of Mary. So that's recent. And so it raises these questions of trajectory um, and it just furthers the divide between us for this to be declared as an infallible dogma obligatory upon Christians to believe. Um, so yeah, this is just a, this, this is kind of a flashpoint in the ecumenical engagement, it seems. So then let's talk about what the actual view is. What is the bodily assumption of Mary? Okay, the basic idea is, is pretty simple. I can be brief on this just to say, um, it's, it's just the belief that at the end of her earthly life, Mary was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. And uh, it, it is not making a claim about whether she died first. You could, you could believe either of, of those options as a Catholic. You could believe that she died, was buried, then subsequently was resurrected and assumed into heaven. Or you could believe she was immediately translated into heaven. But um, it's, it's a bodily assumption. So it's, it's not just her soul. It's, it's body and soul assumed into heaven. And like I said, it's uh, the most recent Catholic dogma. It's uh, so in 1950, uh, not not long ago, and it's the fourth of what are the four uh, Marian dogmas of the Catholic Church. Maybe it'd be helpful just to state these. Um, sure. Uh, the the first is the divine motherhood of Mary; that Mary is the mother of God. The second is the perpetual virginity of Mary; that uh, Mary remained a virgin all throughout her life an immaculate conception, Mary is born free from the stain of original sin, and then the bodily assumption. So these are the four Catholic dogmas about Mary. Okay, and then uh, why is the assumption in particular, why is it like important to critically evaluate this particular Marian doctrine or dogma? Yeah, th th this is helpful to work through because I think a lot of people are wary about Mariology. So the, the term Mariology just means the theological study of Mary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, you know, they might have the attitude of, okay, well, yeah, that stuff is a little weird. I'm not sure about that, but that's okay. You know, I'll just accept the rest of the Catholic teaching or it could be the Orthodox teaching or whatever. Um, and the, the concern here is that actually these dogmas, as well as Marian devotion, so this would include, say, prayers to Mary, for example, are obligatory upon Catholic Christians. Pope Francis made that clear just a few years ago. Uh, Marian devotion is not optional for Catholic Christians, okay? And these dogma are obligatory upon Christian belief. They are held to be infallible. So they are taught at the same authority level that we receive Holy Scripture. So um, that means, and you can read through, when Pius XII, who was the Pope in 1950, uh, pronounced the bodily assumption of Mary, there are these warnings that uh, for those who 
uh, uh, willfully reject it. They have fallen away from the faith. Uh, if anyone dares to oppose it, uh, they will merit the wrath of God and the wrath of the apostles Peter and Paul. Now, there's a little bit of uh, wiggle room there in terms of how you interpret that, but the statements are also, I mean, people will try to say, well, it has to be a, like a, a willful, like you have to know it's true in your heart and still reject it. I don't know. I mean, it, it, I think the statements are, they kind of speak for themselves, but however you try to qualify it, it's clear that these are not an option. Like you can't say, well, I'm going to become Catholic, but just reject the Marian stuff. You know, these are a part of the infallible and thereby irreformable teaching of the Catholic Church. Um, and when you when you listen to, uh, you know, Catholic, the, like Cardinal Newman, okay, John Henry Newman has written a lot about Mariology. You listen to them, you, you, you see that Mariology is kind of interwoven with the whole Catholic system. Uh, the, the, the piety as well as the doctrine. This is not a sidebar. This is not optional. This is kind of, and, and, and therefore I would say for everyone who's considering the kinds of questions that, you know, you and I have talked about and others who so many who are wrestling with these things, it's completely appropriate to give critical analysis to Mariology and not just say, well, that's, you know, put that to the side and don't think about it. It's totally appropriate to say, Hey, we need to, I need to make a decision about this. Do I believe that this is true or not? And a lot of that will depend upon one's view of authority, you know, what you believe about the papacy, but also I, I think it's totally appropriate to just look at the evidence and say, Hey, does, it, does this belief seem reasonable? Um, because my concern as a Protestant is uh, honestly a deep offense that this would be declared as an infallible dogma when it has such abysmal lack of biblical and historical support. So it, <clears throat> is there anything in particular about the bodily assumption that is unique to that dogma? That, so the question is basically, is this particular Marian dogma, is this like the one that has the least evidence for it, or is it, it, did we, are we just focusing on this because it's just one of them and we just picked one? Yeah, that, it, I would say it does have the, the least. I would say what I've done is I've tried to just very carefully work through the patristic evidence, so the evidence from the church fathers, and um, I could sketch out my basic proposal, uh, even though it will offend some Protestants too. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, it'll offend both sides, but uh, the first Catholic dogma need not be a point of division between us. Lots of Protestants stumble over calling Mary the mother of God, but that is something all Christians can affirm. Karl Barth, who is a Protestant theologian, even said this understood is understood properly. Understood properly. This is he said this is a litmus test of uh, do you understand the incarnation? Because and the reason for that is simple. Jesus is God. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. And that's that goes back to the Council of Ephesus in 431, the Theotokos, Mary the the, the uh, God bearer. Uh, that need not be a point of division for us. And if Protestants really struggle with that, I would just encourage them to consider that sympathetically. That that need not be freighted with all the later developments. Originally, that idea was a Christological affirmation. It's trying to say something about the incarnation. Um, the second through fourth Marian dogmas, I think, are all post-apostolic accretions. Uh, you can see, but I think when you go forward, so two, three, four, the evidence for them gets worse and worse. Um, I don't know. I mean, some people would say the Immaculate Conception is, is the most difficult because there are so many countervailing uh, points of evidence for that. In Chrysostom, in Basel, and many others who will speak of Mary as having sinned. Uh, but this one is just so late. It's just so palpably late in the patristic era that it first comes in to the church. And uh, that really is, I just think it's really problematic. And I think people really need to, to wrestle with that and say, do I want to accept a system which is, re you know, requiring this belief of me, but it gives every indication of being a post-apostolic accretion. So what what is the general scholarly consensus on when belief in Mary's assumption like began? Okay, I will give the answer to this and then I will defend the answer. Uh, the answer is late fifth century, okay? Between 450 and 550. So late fifth century, early sixth hmm. century. That rough period of time is when into the Christian church, this 
idea starts to come. And even there, it is extremely diverse. So it's not just the bodily assumption that starts coming up into the historical record at that point. There's two alternative ideas that are also prominent. And it takes about that period of time to settle and land upon one of them. And then I've all, and I'm writing a book right now on, on, on this and other things. I just finished the chapter on the assumption of Mary and other aspects of Mariology. So I'm working through this. So, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that even there, uh, it, it continues to be questioned by some. For a long period of time, there's a ninth century theologian named Pascasius Redbertus, great medieval name. He, quite, he, he preached in his Dormition homilies an assumption of Mary's soul only. And that halted the uh, uh, belief in the bodily assumption for about two centuries. And everything that I'm saying right now is consistent with Catholic scholars. So let me give some examples of that. Um, uh, older scholars, uh, historians of dogma and Mariologists like Juniper Carroll, uh, Ludwig Ott, Walter Burghardt, these are older Catholic scholars. They're excellent scholars. They're saying that that's their proposal, late fifth century. More recent scholars, uh, Brian Daly, who is a, a fantastic Roman Catholic scholar uh, working in this area and others uh, that is consistent with his proposal. And then Stephen Shoemaker is another kind of leading scholar on this. He's not Catholic himself, but he's very fair to Catholics. And that's consistent with his proposal as well. So uh, I'm trying to be very clear on this because I do receive sometimes very uncharitable responses uh, in comments and other venues that are trying to diminish my, you know, proposing I'm, I'm skewing things or something like that. It really isn't. I'm being very fair to what the Catholic scholars are saying about this. And that is why the leading Catholic theologians in this area don't argue for this as going back through oral tradition to the apostles. They argue for it more as something the Holy Spirit sort of gradually taught the church, something like this. And it's kind of, it's in the apostolic deposit, but kind of in this oblique typological way. And then it more consciously comes into the church's knowledge as you get that. That's how they tend to argue. The one thing I do want to say is that it is tricky and people get confused about this because there is interest in Mary's end that comes up big time in the fourth century. And there's a lot of speculation that she was a martyr. And there are two heterodox texts that reference an assumption of Mary that are earlier. Uh, one of them is a set of texts called the Six Book Dormition Apocryphon, and that's associated with a heretical group that is condemned by Epiphanius in the late fourth century. The heretical group is called the Coloridians. And then the other text is a Gnostic legend um, called the Book of Mary's Repose that many people will date to the third century. So uh, these are, I mean, the Book of Mary's Repose is really bad. I mean, it will offend all of us in terms of how scandalous it is um, on several levels. And, you know, maybe we can come back and talk about that text more because that is the earliest attestation and it's Gnostic. But um, so there's those two texts that are condemned by the church. But in terms of when this sort of starts to shape as a belief within the church, that is the time frame. 450 to 550, and that is consistent with the best of the scholarship, including the best of Catholic scholarship working in this area. So what did the actual, like the early church fathers and everything, what did they actually say about Mary's fate? Or, or, did, or was it even talked about? Yeah, yeah. This is interesting. They talked a lot about it. Um, Tertullian and Augustine, Tertullian is the first person I can find who talked about Mary dying. Uh, Augustine has three references to Mary's death that I can locate, and never any. And they just mention the the death. They don't also mention some some kind of belief in, a, in an assumption. That's correct. There's nothing of an, an assumption in in any Orthodox Christian writer. Okay, prior to that 450, to my awareness. I mean, you always want to be open to sure. new evidence coming in, but when all, everybody else is saying the same thing, it seems pretty. So you've got, so you got Tertullian, you've got Augustine talking about Mary's dying. Another thing that's interesting is you have a lot of people listing bodily assumptions to heaven. I have located in my research with the help of a friend, 10 different authors. Well, nine plus the apostolic constitutions, which is a compilation of texts. So 10 different texts, I suppose, but several of these authors have multiple instances. So uh, Augustine, Chrysostom, and Tertullian each have three times where they'll do this. And then these other authors, Jerome, Ambrose, 
Methodius, Irenaeus. Uh, I think there's one other I'm forgetting, but um, it, it make a to, list of us of assumptions into heaven. Am I yes, hearing this correctly? Now, okay, that is correct. Now, not everyone will say, "Here's a list," and it's exhaustive. You know, so mm-hmm. you want to be careful because I'm always wanting to be alert to respond to this criticism of an argument from silence. You know, but. The it fact still is, seems pretty significant. That's, that's one of the big ones that you'd want to mention. Totally. I mean, if Mary is the most important creature, if Mary played the, the role in the, early, in the early church that Mary plays in the contemporary Catholic church, and you've got 10 different times people list those bodily assumed to heaven, it's pretty surprising that they just never happen to mention, oh, by the way, it happened to the Theotokos too, you know. Um, the, it's always Enoch and Elijah. The only two other people that would come in would be Moses, where I think it's Augustine who is a time where he's opposing somebody out there proposed Moses was assumed to heaven and he's opposing that. And then there's some uh, uh, text. I can't remember what the text is, but it proposes that Habakkuk was like transported to Babylon, something like this. And so he's opposing that idea. But in terms of the people assumed to heaven, it's always Enoch and Elijah. And they'll, you know, they'll, so like people will be talking about the nature of the resurrection body and they'll say, but, you know, we know this is true because of those who are assumed to heaven, a.k.a. Enoch and Elijah. And so that's pretty, um, you know, I actually think arguments from silence can have plausibility value to the extent where you'd expect the source material not to be silent on something. Mm-hmm. The metaphor I use in the book is suppose that you heard on the radio there was a school shooting and you're really worried, what if it's the school my kids go to, and you drive onto campus, and you talk to 10 different people, and you say, was there a school shooting here? And they all say, I didn't hear anything about that. Well, that will that will probably relieve you, and the degree of plausibility that that will have will depend upon how big the campus is, and how many people are there, and other factors like that. If it's a small campus, and 10 people are all saying, well, I didn't hear anything about this, you know, at a certain point, that starts to become less and less plausible that it really would have happened at that school. Similarly, it, the more people you have talking about bodily assumptions to heaven, but never mentioning Mary, it starts to raise a plausibility concern. But here's the last thing I want to mention, and this is where it, it kind of drives the nail in. It, it becomes more conclusive. Toward the end of the fourth century, as there is a, this spiraling up interest in martyrs and virgins, uh, there's a great interest in Mary's final fate. People are are wondering, and there's theories out there, maybe, you know, as I mentioned, some of these Gnostic legends that are talking about uh, Mary's being assumed to heaven. There's, so there's two by this point. So a uh, Christian named Epiphanius conducts a careful uh, research into this question of what happened at the end of Mary's life. I mean, it's kind of astonishing we have this evidence, you know, and he... Uh, he lived near Jerusalem. He had contacts in Jerusalem. Walter Burkhardt, the Catholic scholar in this area, he talks about how if anybody would have known uh, anything, the people who would have been associated with an oral tradition, it would have been him because Jerusalem is usually where Mary was purported to have died um, or to have been assumed to heaven, whatever, either way. And Epiphanius's conclusion is no one knows. No one knows her end. He says, uh, maybe she stayed alive. Maybe she just died a normal death and maybe she was a martyr, but nobody knows. No one knows her end. Now, there are various ways Catholics will respond to that and try to get around to that. They'll say, oh, well, that just he's just saying nobody knows whether she died before she was assumed, because as I mentioned, the dogma leaves that open, but that's just not what he says. You have to read that into the text. He, he posits her staying alive as an alternative possibility to her death by natural causes or her death by martyrdom and concludes nobody knows. And what that tells us, similar to what a lot of the Catholic scholars will acknowledge, is there isn't some generally known oral tradition. Because that, that's what people say. They'll say, oh, well, we have no written evidence, but there's an oral tradition that, we, that, that was going on. And it's like, well, if there was an oral tradition, why wouldn't Epiphanius have heard of that? Why is he saying nobody knows after carefully investigating the matter? And then all the way into the 7th century you still have people like Isidore of Seville saying the same thing. He's saying, oh, some people think Mary was a martyr, but we can't say for sure. We don't know whether she was a martyr, you know, and he's, he's kind of opposing that idea. So I think the testimony of Epiphanius is even 
more confirmatory for the impression you already get of just, it doesn't seem like anybody had any conception of a bodily assumption of Mary for that first several hundred years of church history. So what about Revelation 12? Like some people use that as a, kind of a a text that, that might implicate the assumption of Mary. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think this is a, uh, well, my wife is always encouraging me to be more blunt. <laughs> so I guess I'll try to be blunt. I, I think it is a somewhat desperate effort to try to read the assumption into a text. And I, I, I don't want to, I'm sorry if that, may, you know, gives offense to people, but I need to say this because it's important enough. There's, uh, first of all, there's no hint of a bodily assumption in the passage, an assumption into heaven. And second of all, well, the, the tell the that, audience before, before you start on that, tell the audience like what is contained in Revelation 12. Okay. This is in the book of Revelation. John sees a, a sign that appears in heaven, and it's a woman, and she's being persecuted by this dragon. And she gives birth to several children, one of whom is the Messiah, so Jesus. So, uh, and then there's uh, later in the chapter, she gives birth to several other children. Um, the woman is identified as having uh, the sun, moon, and stars uh, as her garments. And the basic thing I would say to, to make two points about this, number one is uh, that imagery is drawn straight out of the Old Testament. In, in the book, I give six examples or so, six-ish, of passages that refer to the people of God. So the woman represents the people of God, the faithful people of God. Um, this is clear from the imagery of the Old Testament where a woman in the travail of childbirth is a frequent image for God's people, but especially from the sun, moon, and stars imagery, which is taken out of Genesis 37, 9, where it refers to Joseph's 12 brothers who become the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was the universal view, uh, to my awareness, of the early church until you start to get speculation about Mary's end that this woman is the church. A lot, there's a lot of strong reasons for that in the text. If uh, Number one, the woman gives birth to the Messiah when she's already in heaven. And she gives birth to other children as well who are persecuted by the dragon. Um, the time of her persecution is indicated as 1260 days. That's the exact same amount of time the church is persecuted in uh, Revelation 11.3. And this is drawn from the book of Daniel, that time period, about a three and a half year period. Um, and, uh, also she has labor pains now, at, not at the level of infallibility, but at the level of the ordinary magisterium, the Catholic church denies that uh, they, they teach that Mary was preserved from labor pains during her delivery. So that's another little wrinkle It's just, but you know, th there's no way you can get a bodily assumption of Mary at the end of her life. E even if you tried to say, well, cause they'll try to say, well, the woman's a church, but it's also Mary. It's a double fulfillment. But then say, okay, where would you get a bodily assumption uh, at the end of Mary's life? All these things that Mary is doing, the, the, or, or the, the woman is, is having happened to her, the persecution for 1260 days, giving birth to the Messiah and these other children, all that is happening in heaven, you know? So, um, and, the, and the last thing I'll say on this is they try to draw it from the Ark of the Covenant typology, because in the previous chapter, there was a reference to the Ark in heaven. But um, there really is a good reason to see a, a, a new narrative starting. It's like the seven bowls of judgment or something like that that are going along, along in Revelation 8, 9, 10, 11. And then there's a new sign that appears at, at Revelation 12, verse 1. So, uh, you know, I, I think if people were to try to read through, the, the way I put it is this. If, if you took 1,000 people who'd never heard of the bodily assumption of Mary, and you gave them all Revelation 12 and said, read this text, tell us what it means. And they can read the rest of the Bible to cross-reference. I don't think anybody would come up with the idea of a bodily assumption of Mary at the end of her life. Uh, it just wouldn't fit with the 1260 days, with the clear imagery for the woman as the people of God, um, and with the other details such as the, the, the sequence of events. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, and, and again, I, I don't know of anybody who advocated for that interpretation until you start to see interest. I think Epiphanius is the first person who proposed to regard this woman as Mary. So was that like kind of your concluding thoughts of the evidence on 
the, the evidence from both sides that it's just ultimately it's just kind of inconclusive or, or would you say that the evidence is against because we would expect you know going back to this sort of argument from silence kind of notion it, it, we would expect to find evidence in, in the historical record and we don't we don't find it there and so that that is very surprising on the hypothesis that mary was assumed into heaven are you saying say that the little, evidence is, a, is against it? More that, um, uh, because of the, some of the things I mentioned, like with Epiphanius, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just looks like there's no awareness of a bodily assumption or anything like that. And if I could just make one more point about that, that might be helpful to further the challenge for those who will want to say that this is just an oral tradition that it was preserved in the church and wasn't written down. I think one of the problems is when, I, and I alluded to this earlier, is when the bodily assumption of Mary does come into the picture in that late fifth century time period, it comes into the picture along with two other alternative ideas. One of them is an assumption of Mary's soul only, but her body is buried. And you see that in various of these traditions, the Dormition homily of Jacob of Sirug is one, uh, the tradition in Pseudo Dionysius is another. And then another option is there's so many texts that have a translation of Mary's body to a special place to await reunion with her soul in heaven at the final judgment. Okay. And um, the place is understood variously in different ones of the text, but that's not a bodily assumption to heaven. So it's important for people to understand that if you're saying this is an oral tradition preserved for generations, and then it just, you know, the question is, well, why does it suddenly pop up alongside these alternative ideas? And Daly's proposal is that it takes about one century or so for those to kind of congeal into one consistent narrative. Another problem is when the, uh, these traditions start popping up in the historical record, several of the texts pseudo Miletus's transitus narrative is one example of this. John of Thessalonica's Hormish, uh, Dormition homily is another that are apologizing for the late arrival. They're, they're, they're acknowledging the lack of earlier precedent for this tradition and the way they're trying to explain it. So you say, okay, if there's an oral tradition, why are people apologizing for the lack of earlier attestation when it does come in? And the last problem I want to mention is the heterodox origins. It is a, you know, I, I sort of shake my head when I hear Catholics appealing to the book of Mary's repose to try to get that date earlier. They're trying to work that date back into like the third century. If you appeal to the book of Mary's repose for earlier attestation of the assumption of Mary, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because this is a Gnostic legend. It's, it has an angel Christology. People could read through this online. It's a, it's an absolutely bizarre uh, story. It has an angel Christology. So Jesus is an angel in this story. He's called the great cherub of light. Um, he says in the, in the text, I am not the son, capital S, son. Um, it has all kinds of scandalous, terrible uh, details about Mary. She's a sinful person who is afraid of dying. At one point, Joseph rebukes her for not guarding her virginity. And then Joseph wonders if he has impregnated her while drunk. Okay. Um, it has a Gnostic creation myth. So this is a text condemned by the Christians. And that's why a lot of people think that the Assumption of Mary was an infiltration into the Christian church from heterodox origins, particularly because of the Coloridians in the fourth century, another heretical group that are practicing a, a Marian devotion, and Epiphanius is opposing them. So when people try to appeal to these earlier texts, that's compounding the problems because it gives credence to the criticism of what many scholars have said, namely the origins of the Assumption of Mary are Gnostic. Um, I, I don't say that myself because I don't know 100%, but it, it, I can say it looks like that because that's the earliest text that we have. So all of those factors to me would combine to make the conclusion much more, you know, it's a, the thing of you never want to overstate, but you never want to understate. And I would want to state it uh, appropriately by saying, I think the evidence is overwhelming against the idea that Mary was assumed. Just consider the evidence for this compared to that for Jesus's resurrection in terms of the timing, you know, 
Uh, people like Mike Lacona and all these other great apologists give these great defenses. I was amazed at how good of a defense can be given for the resurrection of Christ. I'd almost see the Assumption of Mary, resurrection of Christ, is on the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of historical evidence that would be supportive for belief in them. So one question that I've got for you is, what are we, like, how much evidence does this give against Catholicism in your mind? Like, could this be overcome with other considerations? How, like, how how big of a problem is this for Catholics, really? Yeah, it. That's because so here, here's ahead. just kind of some some of my thinking is so if mm -hmm. someone was convinced that there, there's all of this evidence for the truth of the papacy, okay, and I know that you disagree with that, right? You you don't think that there there is that, but suppose that someone comes to this conversation with that belief that. The papacy has, there's all of this evidence for the truth of the papacy, and then they come to believe that, you know, everything that's sort of affirmed by the Catholic Church or affirmed by the Pope is something that they ought to affirm as well. And so what would you, like, I don't know. I, I don't know what the nature of my question really ultimately is with that caveat, because I'm still trying to work through that myself. Like, how much can the papacy actually be used to overcome these these types of like counter evidence that you might so I, I suppose it would then come down to how strong is your case that you've got for the papacy versus how strong the case is for these you know for the for the marian dogmas being sort of made up or untrue so i it, it might come down to like a comparing not necessarily apples and oranges but you might just be comparing two different types of evidence and so you, you'd ultimately just have to decide between the two which one you think is which, which one has a stronger case for it? And in your view, you know, both of them are, are going to lean you toward Protestantism ultimately. Mm -hmm. So I understand that that's probably what you'll want to say about the, the papacy. But I suppose then the question is like, yeah, how much evidence does this particular issue give against the truth of Catholicism? Is it is it a lot? Is it a little? Is it going to be, you know, someone who thinks that the papacy is like there's a really strong case, could they overcome it easily? Or would they have a really tough problem with it? What, what what is your what is your view? Yeah, no, I, I I'm tracking with how you're thinking about that, and it is true. I mean, if someone had like a rock solid conviction of the papacy, I think mm -hmm. that that's how they could overcome this and just say, well, look, you know, um, it'd be despite it'd be the might... silence. Well, and uh, again, it's that I want to move away from calling it silence because when we've got people saying. I live near Jerusalem. I know the context there. I'm in carefully investigating this. And I'm telling you, nobody knows in the late fourth century. That's mm -hmm. a positive indicative uh, point of evidence. But I think if someone said it'd be, it might be comparable to someone if they felt like there was like these egregious errors in the Bible. And yet they also had really strong reasons to believe in biblical inerrancy. They could say something like, well, you know, um, I, I don't know how to resolve these issues, but I have enough evidence over here for thinking in biblical inerrancy that I'm just, I'm going to keep looking at it and trust that there are answers, even if I can't see them now. But I, the way I think about this is that the issue of Mariology is one of the things that needs to be considered in the evaluation of the claims of the papacy, because I think the evidence is, is strong enough that it, it, it itself raises questions against the papacy. And I guess I need to put it as strong as to say, although I, deeply admire the richness of the Catholic tradition in many ways. I feel this great sense of even offense, I could put it at that, that, that a church would dogmatize something at, at the level of infallibility. I just see it as this like a, atomic bomb in the middle of ecumenical relations. It's like, how can you do that? You know, how can you say that with, as an infallible truth, uh, this is incumbent upon Christian belief at the risk of the wrath of God, Peter and Paul, if you willfully oppose it. Um, and yet it just gives every indication of not being apostolic. And th that's where I, I, you know, as a Protestant, I really want to make sure what we believe is tethered to the apostolic teaching, because I do think mm -hmm. accretions come into the mix throughout church history. Yeah. And it, and it would kind of like the hypothesis, you know, the Protestant hypothesis that this was a, a later accretion, as you say, that would make sense of the data. And so, Ultimately, yeah, it is still kind of a question in my mind, though, is, is how strong this evidence actually is. I would say that it's it's moderate. I would say it's it's probably better than some of the arguments against the papacy that I've heard. So it's it's one of the better ones. Would you say? Would would you agree with that? 
it's one of the it's one of the better considerations that that favor Protestantism over Catholicism. Yeah, it's tough to set the dials exactly right because when we I know. evaluate the strength of an argument, it depends on so many variable factors. You know, yeah. um, I can just give my own personal testimony without you know, trying to have the desire of neither offending people unnecessarily nor refraining from speaking my conscience, I would say for me personally, the evident, the, the issue of Mariology is decisive and overwhelming against the Catholic claims. And those of, of Eastern Orthodoxy, for example, as well. And uh, the reason is, I, I just think it's a reasonable approach to when you've got overwhelming historical evidence of uh, and I would use that adjective. I, I try not to overstate things, but at the same time, you want to state it clearly when it is strong. I would say the same thing for the veneration of images. And I see it too. I think the evidence is overwhelming against that being apostolic. And that's the next chapter in the book I'm going to write. That's I'm going to start writing that as soon as I can. Although my wife and I are having a baby on Monday. <laughs> so I may be out of commission so for a little while here. Is she being induced or something? Is that how yeah, you know? We have a, it, we have a C-section scheduled. It's always weird oh, to say, okay. you know, we got a baby. We're having a baby. Put the date on the calendar. Or that's when the yeah. baby's coming. But uh, yeah, so I might be out of commission for a little bit. Good for me to mention that in case people wonder yeah. where, why I'm, I'm not on YouTube. But um, yeah, but so I, I, I would I would say the I would say the issue of Mariology to me is a really decisive problem. Uh, because, and the reason is, I, I can't go against my conscience. I can't affirm something I don't believe is true. And I don't believe Mary was assumed to heaven. I, I want to honor Mary. I think she's an amazing woman of God. She is a unique vessel of the Lord. We want to honor her. She is, in a, she is a model to us all. But I just don't think she was assumed to heaven. And so I couldn't, like for me, I couldn't become Catholic even if I wanted to because I would be going against my sincere convictional beliefs. Okay, so I actually, while you were uh, talking, I, I put in the live chat, I said, hey, do you have any questions for Dr. Ortland? And I was thinking, I did it early because I was like, I, I, I didn't know if we were going to have enough, but so many questions have come in. And we've already had several super chats come in. So uh, we'll get to those in just a minute. If you do have another question, we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. But if you have a question for Dr. Ortland, sending it as a super chat might be your only way of getting it answered today. But before we move to some q and I actually have a really exciting announcement. We have partnered a with, oh, and there it is, with Hallow. So Hallow is a, a Bible app, but it was a Christian prayer app, and it's the number one Christian prayer app in the U.S., and it's also the number one Catholic app in the world. And I actually use it as a Protestant. Uh, the, the, the main way that I use it is actually the music. So I listen to like, they've got Catholic lo-fi here from Matt Frad, which I listen to when I'm like working or doing other things. They've also got these like traditional chants and like hymns and stuff. And it might seem weird as a Protestant to listen to this stuff, but it really, when I put these on, it really does put me in like a really good, calm headspace. And and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm excited to talk to you about Hallow and like tell you about it is because I think it can actually help you if you're experiencing like anxiety and you're trying to find something that's going to help. You know, there, there's all different, there's all sorts of different things that can help with your anxiety, but one of them could be as simple as just listening to some good music, something that's going to help calm you down and just relax you. And that's where I think Hallow might come in for you it is, um, apart from like, you know, the devotional stuff that they've got, and they've even have, uh, on, on the app here that you can also do sleep with, uh, you know, Jonathan Rumi from the chosen, They've got all sorts of things here to help you sleep and fall asleep, but they, you know, they've got the devotions and the prayers and they've got thousands and thousands of those, but the, the music itself is really what I've been utilizing a whole lot on this app. But I want you to go check it out for yourself. You can go to hallow.com slash capturing Christianity. You can get your first three months free as a sort of free trial. So you can kind of check out all the different uh, meditations and prayers and stuff. And as I said, it, it really can, I think it, it, you know, it's not, there is no sort of silver bullet when it comes to anxiety or depression or, or any kind of mental health issue. But I think that if you have certain things that are, that are kind of in your corner and that are there to help you, this could be one of those things. And it, I, I really true, honestly believe that because I've seen it already work in, in my own life, even in like stressful situations, I would just put on this app and I would start to listen to stuff and I would immediately start to feel calmer. And so I want you to go check it out. Hallow. You can search search for it. You can find it in the Apple 
excuse me, the, the Apple Play Store, the Google Play Store, you can find it everywhere. So, all right, let's get into some Q&A with Dr. Ortland on the assumption of Mary. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of Super Chats that have come in already, so we, we may only have time to get to those today. How much time do you have, Gavin? I don't have a ton, but I definitely want to answer some questions. So I'll try to answer as, as succinctly as I can, and we'll just go as, as long as we can. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll just uh, we'll move through these as quickly as we can. All right, from Mango Bango. Hi, Dr. Gavin. I believe you're incorrect. You said that the Assumption of Mary was a late teaching around the 5th century, yet the 2nd century Vienna fragment speaks about the bodily assumption. What are your thoughts? Yeah, people will often try to appeal to certain fragments. Uh, more commonly, a set of Syri Syriac fragments. Sometimes they'll, I think, confusedly refer to the book of Mary's repose as well as supportive evidence um, that ex extend back earlier. Um, those claims just have not been received in the scholarship. That's not really representative of mainstream positions about this, including among Catholic scholars. So I think I just need to stick to my guns there and say, don't take my word for it. Go read the big text edited by Juniper Carroll, a Catholic Mariologist, on this topic. Go read Brian Daly, the Catholic scholar. Go read Shoemaker. Read read the best of the people working in this area. And that way it won't be about me having to defend it. It'll be the Catholic scholars having to defend it because the time frame I've proposed is consistent with that scholarship. Yeah, as you said, that was that was very succinct. So, all right, Phoenix Baker, what do you think about Shoemaker changing his mind and saying it's very plausible that assumption texts are from second century? Okay, a couple things here. First, I don't think he's changed his mind. He talks about the Book of Mary's Repose in his 2006, I believe. It could be 2009, something like that, or the first decade of the 2000s. It's an Oxford University Press book on this topic. He talks about it there, and then he talks about that also in his 2016 book uh, on Marian devotion. So the, the first the book is on Dormition narratives, second one on Marian devotion. So I don't think he changes his mind. It's in both texts, unless the questioner is referring to some prior belief that he had way back before writing the, those books. I, I think he's been consistent. It's not texts. There's one text, the Book of Mary's Repose, and it's not the second century. He says third century, possibly second century. Um, but the, the main thing is that this is a Gnostic text condemned by the Christian church. So to the extent that people put weight upon this as supportive evidence for uh, an early tradition of Mary's assumption, it would just be more of a problem because it would indicate that this belief came from Gnostic origins. And I earlier I've already referenced some of the specific beliefs, Jesus as an angel, a Gnostic creation account, scandalous beliefs about Mary, etc. People could go read the book of Mary's Repose online or they could read it in the first appendix of Shoemaker's first book. Um, so I think that that would be a real problem if people tried to say that this was, this is where the tradition began, because it would cement the concern that many have articulated that this is a, a belief that has origins in a, a Gnostic milieu. All right, from Anthony Costello, thank you guys for sending in these super chats. Do you think that the tens of thousands of Marian devotees that travel to places like Medjugor, I think that's how you say that, year after year are honoring Jesus as much as they are Mary? Are these visionaries really seeing Mary? Okay, I will try to steer between two alternatives here. I don't want to make a judgment on any particular person's motives or intentions. I don't know exactly what is in someone's heart or mind or imagination, and I don't know exactly what they are experiencing. I, I don't know, and I'll just leave the, the, the judgment of that to God. Um, the other thing, though, is I, I do think it's reasonable to step back and look at the big picture and feel a concern that uh, the level and nature of devotion to Mary does seem excessive within Catholic piety. And I think many Catholics could probably admit that. Um, it does seem to kind of go off the rails at times. And so a, a classical Protestant concern would just be that we are to honor those godly Christians who have gone before, among whom Mary has a, a special status in certain ways. She's an amazing woman of God, amazing model of faith, and was un used uniquely by God to bring about the incarnation. But 
it, oh boy, I mean, it, it, it really does seem as though things have become mushroomed up into great excess. And, you know, uh, I guess I just need to say there's a, a concern that there is idolatry at times and that the feelings of intense loyalty and love and devotion that are sometimes given to her are those that properly should be given to God only. And that is, you know, that's that's the promising concern, which I want to be faithful to represent. So we've got a really good question from a guy named Baby P. He says, Gav, how can we engage Catholics on this topic by appealing to scripture, tradition, and history if the infallible magisterium determines what all those areas are to begin with? How can mm. we progress? Yeah. I appreciate this question, too, because it's getting at a kind of methodological point that can plague the discussion and, and make it difficult to make progress. And uh, I would say one thing that can help is that the Roman Catholic Church, according to my understanding, does limit the power of the magisterium in principle. So they don't say that the magisterium can just say anything. They purport that the role of the magisterium is that of interpretation for sacred scripture, sacred tradition. Now, we will have a concern that in practice, it is more than just interpretation. It is sort of creative in its effect, but that's what they're saying. And so that creates a possible point of contact for dialogue to say, okay, if this is purported to be an interpretation of sacred scripture and sacred tradition, then we can go to sacred scripture and sacred tradition and say, is this a good interpretation? Is this reasonable? Now, ultimately, you'll often still bump up into the, the, the charge of, well, we believe that this office is infallible or capable of infallibility. So that still will, you might still get to an impasse, but at least you can be looking at common source material to work out the differences there. You know, you can be looking at Holy Scripture and saying, what does it teach? And then I would say also a, a way we can make progress is uh, to talk about the papacy itself, to talk about that, uh, to talk about the magisterium, to talk about, is it plausible, this system of authority, you know, for all of the invectives poured upon sola scriptura. I love sola scriptura. I think sola scriptura is modest and reasonable. Um, but the if someone doesn't like sola scriptura, they've got to have an alternative to that. This is one possible alternative, scripture, tradition, magisterium, and interpretation. And, uh, you know, I think we just need to talk about that itself and say, is this um, supported by the biblical and historical evidence? Is this, uh, does it solve the problems it's purported to solve? Um, and, and so forth. So I guess in one way, all of our discussions about particulars do tend to funnel back to that issue of authority. And that's where we'll need to keep keep just working at that issue itself. All right. We had a super chat just come in from Joel and he says, uh, he actually has a question for me. He says, Cam, this is mainly for you. Do you believe Mary is sinless? This one question clears the whole debate. Dr. Gavin, you can chime in as well. So as a Protestant, I would say no. And, and what I, I was thinking about this, and I think the only real consideration that I've got for this is from a kind of frequency argument. So it's just like if you just take a sampling of any any random person from history and ask, was this person sinless? Then the answer is going to be very likely no. Very likely they were not sinless. So, and I think the same is going to apply when we look at, at Mary. And then the question would be, well, what other evidence, what sort of counter evidence would be able to overcome this initial improbability that we've got? Now, there are questions though on how reliable these sorts of uh, frequency type judgments are. So that's one thing that I've kind of been, that, that's going on in the back of my mind is that like, when it comes to arguments for the existence of God, I'll just give a different example. Some people say, well, we can't really judge the probability of how likely a, a, a life permitting universe would be because we only have one sample. Like we only have one universe. We can't test other universes. We can't see what else is out there. And so because we've only got one sample, our sample size is one, then we can't really actually make up or we can't really assess the probability of uh, a life permitting universe, how likely that would be. So, um, however, I think that that's mistaken. I think that type of reasoning is, is fallacious. It relies on something called frequentism improbability. And I don't want to get into the, all the nitty gritty details here because it would take us too off topic. But I just want to say that, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit wary of these sort of frequency type arguments to, 
to bolster probabilities. So when I, and this is what mine is based on, it's based on like a frequency type argument. So it just seems really unlikely given the, the whole number of people uh, the, uh, given everyone who has existed and how, you know, 99.9999999% of them have been, uh, th- have had sin, then it just seems likely that when we take one individual person, it's going to be very likely that they also experienced sin or, or had sin. And so when we apply that to Mary, that's that's what we get. But then again, as I said, I'm kind of skeptical of those arguments and other apologetic contexts. So, I don't know how strong of an argument that would be. I think that we would still have to consider other uh, all of the evidence, and and it's a partic- like this subject Mariology is not something that I've done a whole lot of research into myself, and this is why part of the reason why I've got Dr. Gavin on the channel is to to learn from him and to really look into these issues at a deeper level. But Dr. Gavin, what you got? What are your thoughts? Right, I, I I would say I don't have any reason to affirm that Mary was sinless. I, I just wouldn't have any reason to think mm-hmm. that. Um, but I think we can speak of her as a, a woman of God a, and a great model of faith. I told you I'd be succinct. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, do you have time for one more question or you got to sure. go? Sure. That's okay. Fine. One, one more question. It's a really good one from the other Paul. He says, doctor, uh, question for, for Ortland. Have you read Yabara's blog posts wherein he basically admits historical data doesn't affect dogma, even if the assumption first appeared in the 11th century? Yeah, um, I have, and uh, kudos to Paul for staying up so late because I, I have a feeling he's stayed up very late to watch this. So nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I re- I don't recall if I've read Eric's material on this point. I think I have. I, if I'm remembering, I have read. I have engaged with him in conversation and read some of his writings on um, this kind of appeal in general. And I would have to say that I really like Eric. I, I find him to be one of those interlocutors on the other side where you can really have a great and productive conversation with them mm-hmm. because you have a sense they're coming from a place of sincerity and they're willing to consider what you're saying and they're not doing the triumphalist stuff. Um, but yeah, I think, and I would say this is how the better uh, Roman Catholic theologians tend to argue today. One of my, one of the most wonderful uh, theologians I know is Matthew Levering. He's a fantastic person and a brilliant theologian. He's got a book on the bodily assumption. He tends to argue more in this way. And I think that it, um, I actually respect that way of arguing more. I think it, you know, when you put all the focus upon the authority of the church, it's you, what that allows you to do is be honest with the historical data. So Levering will cite Shoemaker in his book and say, yeah, Shoemaker's right about this. And so Catholics shouldn't argue in that way of trying to say, this goes back to the apostles consciously. And then he, Shoemaker, uh, Levering argues from typology and from the fittingness of the dogma and from the church's authority and considerations like this. He's really retrieving 20th century Catholic arguments for the assumption. Um, so I, I, I respect that way of arguing more than the alternative where people are trying to jam the assumption into like Revelation 12 and other, other things like that. Um, but I'm not persuaded of it. And, you know, I think there are real problems, in my opinion, with putting that level of authority upon the church. I mean, I just think at that point, you know, you've basically just said that the apostolic deposit, in a sense, in effect, it almost doesn't even matter because the church can just tell us anything. And that, you know, I don't want to overstate that, but it seems like it's pushing in that direction. And that would be a deep concern. Hmm. Okay, I think that's going to do it for us today. I, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this subject. It's the first time we've talked about it on the show, so this was a lot of fun. I, I, I learned a whole lot, and I'm looking to looking forward to your book when it comes out eventually. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I enjoyed talking about it. Yeah, I'll hope to make progress on the book, but it'll be a few weeks after we get used to having a baby because this is our fifth child, <laughs> so yeah. we are well, we have a full house. One of the good things about having other children is that they can they can help out. From what I understand, we only have two, and so yeah. we don't have like this this huge family dynamic. And uh, yeah, I, I, but uh, from what I understand, like people that I know who have a whole lot of kids, they're like, oh yeah, the the older ones can can help out. And after a certain amount of kids, like after three, it's just like, what's another you know, what throwing another kid in? What what is it, what is that going to do to the chaos? Because it's already chaos. Totally. That that is exact. People ask if, I, if we're overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm like. 
no, man, we're, we're maxed out already. What's one more? It's, you know, exactly. <laughs> so it'll be yeah. good, but we're, we're overjoyed and we're grateful for another one. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. Well, like I said, I, I really enjoyed talking with you today, learned a whole lot and I'm really looking forward to, to doing some more work together. So thank you guys. Thank you, the audience for tuning in and we'll see you in the next Capturing Christianity video very soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?